Our next speaker is Dr. Phil Ostrovsky, who um, is a registrar working in clinical genetics at Great Ormond Street Hospital and also St. George's. And he's going to cover for us the inheritance patterns of genetic conditions. So thank you so very much, Phil, for coming in and uh, sharing this with us. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I'm just going to see if I can share my slides full screen. Can you see that full screen now? Yes, yeah. you can see yeah. that. Phil. Okay, and and hopefully you can hear me. Um, if my voice goes at any point, um, it, I, I do have extenuating circumstances. I had COVID last week, so if I stop talking abruptly, it is because I've lost the ability to, to do so. But hopefully we'll be okay for 15 minutes. Um, so thank you for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Phil Ostrovsky. I'm a registrar normally based at St George's, but currently on secondment to Great Ormond Street Hospital. And I'm going to give you just a brief overview of um, essentially patterns of inheritance for genetic conditions. So just to put this in sort of clinical context, we often get referrals which are quite light on detail, to put it diplomatically, um, and can say things like review this patient with a family history of sudden cardiac death. And to be able to counsel a patient appropriately, we really need to have a lot more information than that. So you might start by finding out that it was the mother who was affected, and that is useful information. But to really put this in context of the wider family, you would want to have a lot more information to see if you have an idea of how this condition is running in the family. So basically, I'm going to cover sort of the common inheritance patterns that we deal with, um, which are autosomal dominant and recessive, X-linked uh, dominant, which is quite rare, but recessive as well, um, and mitochondrial inheritance. And I appreciate that we have sort of participants from a variety of backgrounds, so I think it's quite useful before we dive into sort of discussing the patterns specifically to explain why they're different, so that hopefully you have an understanding of why it is that these things are inherited in different ways. So basically, the DNA that we have in our cells um, falls largely into two categories. So we have the nuclear DNA, which is the chromosomes that you can see depicted in the middle, um, and mitochondrial DNA, which is basically a whole separate genome that is contained within our mitochondria and is inherited separately. And when we talk about autosomal inheritance, what we mean is the numbered chromosomes from 1 to 22. And all of these chromosomes come in pairs, so we have two copies of each of them. X-linked inheritance relates to the sex chromosomes, which are XX in women and XY in men. And mitochondrial inheritance is this separate mitochondrial genome. Now, when we're talking about autosomal inheritance, it is helpful to introduce the concept of alleles, which is probably familiar to many of you. And basically the idea is because all of these chromosomes are in pairs, each one of them has a copy of a gene on it. So all of our genes basically come in pairs, one on each copy of the chromosome. And when we talk about alleles, what we basically mean is two different versions of a gene. And it's important to note that these can be dominant or recessive. And what that means is if you have a dominant allele, so for example, this one denoted with a capital A, if you carry that allele, that causes a particular trait to be expressed. So if that allele causes a disease, having one copy is enough to cause the disease. Whereas if an allele is recessive, if, it's, if you have one copy of the recessive one and one copy of the dominant one, the recessive one is basically masked by that. So you can carry the recessive one and not show any traits associated with it. But if you have two copies of the recessive allele, then it's the only one you've got and you can express a trait related to it, such as a genetic disease. So starting with dominant inheritance, um, basically the way it works is usually there is an affected parent and they have an altered copy of one of their genes, so one allele here, which is marked in red, and a normal copy. And when they have children, they can pass on either the altered copy, in which case the children develop the disease because it's dominant, so just having one copy is enough to cause disease, or the normal copy, in which case the children are healthy. And the way that it usually runs in families is with a vertical pattern. So if you look at this pedigree, you can see basically from one generation to the next, you can track how this allele, which causes disease, is being passed on from one relative to the next. Gender doesn't influence how it's passed on. 
and the risk to each child is 50%. So we like to draw what we call Punnett squares in genetics. And basically what this represents is these are the two alleles in one parent, these are the two alleles in the other parent, and the possible outcomes when those parents have children. So if you have one parent who carries a copy of the dominant disease causing allele and a normal copy, and the other healthy parent who just has two normal copies, there's basically a 50-50 chance of each child developing the disease or not. And this inheritance pattern applies to the vast majority of inherited cardiac conditions, so most cardiomyopathies and most inherited arrhythmia syndromes. There are a few important caveats that can complicate things that I think we should just briefly touch upon. So the first is that there is always a risk of de novo mutation. And what that basically means is a new genetic change occurring for the first time in the individual who is affected. And that can give you a pedigree like this, where you just have one case in the whole family. And you might think that's reassuring because it's unlikely to be autosomal dominant because it hasn't passed down through the generations. But actually, it's possible that there is just a new genetic change that started in this individual, because every genetic change has to start somewhere. It can be in this generation or 20 generations back, but there is always a first person who was affected. And that's important to know because even though there's no clear family history in the wider family, this person's children could still be at risk. The second concept is inherent is uh, sorry penetrance, which basically means that not everyone who carries a genetic change necessarily develops the features. So even for a dominant condition, um, in some conditions, and this applies to a lot of cardiomyopathies, for example, not every single relative who carries the genetic change will actually develop disease. And it can give you this appearance of skipped relatives. So we know that this person must carry the genetic change because it's passed through them from one generation to the next. But for some reason or another, they just haven't actually developed the phenotype associated with it. And that's helpful to know because it can be a bit of a pitfall sometimes. The fact that someone doesn't have clinical signs doesn't completely rule it out. OK, um, sorry, my phone's gone off at a very awkward time. The Next thing to note is anticipation, which is a phenomenon that particularly applies to neurological conditions. Um, but basically what it means is that the severity of a disease can increase from one generation to the next and the age of onset can decrease. So you can have older generations who develop symptoms in their 70s or 80s, but then younger generations start to have symptoms in their 60s or even their 30s. And a condition which does have some cardiac involvement for which this is relevant is uh, myotonic dystrophy, for example. So that was autosomal dominant inheritance. And again, that is the bulk of what we deal with in cardiac genetics. Um, autosomal recessive inheritance is where you have these recessive alleles. So usually the parents each carry one copy of the recessive allele, but they're healthy because they still have a normal dominant allele to compensate for it. But if they both pass on the recessive allele, you have a child who has both copies which are abnormal and they develop a condition. The way this tends to work in families is usually the parents are healthy and it gives you a horizontal appearance. So with dominant inheritance, you could track it vertically through the generations. With autosomal recessive inheritance, you usually see it appear in a single generation, often in a pair of siblings. Uh, gender doesn't play an effect, and it's often due to consanguinity, so due to parents being related to each other. So in this case, the parents are first cousins, and that makes it much more likely that they both carry a common genetic change that we assume has been inherited from their common ancestors. Now, the risks are a little bit more complicated here in terms of the inheritance, but basically for a couple like this, who we presume are both carriers because they've had affected children, there is a 25% risk of each child being affected. So if they have each have a normal copy and a recessive disease causing copy, there's a one in four chance that they both pass on that disease causing copy, which causes the child to be affected. And a two in four or 50% chance that the child is a carrier. So that child would be unaffected, but there would be a chance of them in turn having a child who is affected. It's a bit different for other relatives, um, including, for example, the person who was affected with the disease, in that their risk is probably quite low unless their partner is also a carrier for the condition. And basically, if you look at a case like this, 
your affected patient has two abnormal copies of the gene. But as long as their partner is not a carrier, we know that their children will definitely inherit a normal copy from the healthy parent. So their children will all be carriers, but none of them will actually be affected because they will always get this normal copy from the other parent. And for most recessive conditions that we talk about, the risk of the unaffected parent being a carrier is pretty low unless they're a biological relative. Although for some conditions that risk can be a bit higher. And examples of genetic conditions which can cause cardiac disease and follow this inheritance are things like Maxwell's disease, which is a particular type of cardiomyopathy, or Pompe disease, which is a storage disorder. Okay, so just to recap, autosomal dominant runs down through the generations vertically, autosomal recessive horizontally in one generation and usually associated or often associated with parental consanguinity. Okay, so that was kind of the bulk of it. Um, and then moving on to X-linked inheritance. So now we're talking about the X and Y chromosomes. So the important thing to note about these is all of our other chromosomes come in pairs, but the sex chromosomes, you can have two X chromosomes or one X and one Y. And that of course determines our gender. So if the father passes on the X chromosome, the child will be a girl. If he passes on his Y chromosome, they will be a boy. And the reason this affects our inheritance patterns is that the X and Y chromosomes are actually quite different from each other. So there are a lot more genes on the X chromosome than the Y chromosome. And that means that for genes that are on the X chromosome, women have two copies of them. But for most of these genes, men only have one because the Y chromosome is basically missing all of the equivalent material. So for X-linked recessive inheritance, which is far more common, usually what we see is a mother can be a carrier for a condition so she has her two x chromosomes one of which carries a disease causing allele and she's usually healthy with that and there's a 50 50 chance of passing on either the healthy one or the modified one now that in itself doesn't determine whether the child will be affected because it will also depend on the gender of the child so if the father passes on his x chromosome then they will have a daughter who is a carrier for the condition but is not expected to be affected. If he passes on his Y chromosome, they would have a son and we would expect him to be affected because he only has one X chromosome, so he only has one copy of this gene. So if there's a problem with this gene, he will develop disease. And the way this tends to run in families is you will usually see that males are affected. So if you look at this pedigree, it is specifically men who are affected. Females are carriers and they're usually healthy. So sometimes they can show some mild signs, but they're usually well. Crucially, there's no male to male transmission. So because a man passes his Y chromosome on to his sons, that's what makes them sons as opposed to daughter, there's no risk of him passing on an X-linked condition to his son. That would you know, completely rule out this being an X-linked condition. And then in terms of the risks, so for a carrier female, so in this case, if you have a woman who has one normal copy and one abnormal copy, there is a 50% chance of passing on that abnormal copy. If it's passed on to a daughter, she'll be a carrier. If it's passed on to a son, he will be affected. If a male with an X-linked condition has children, his sons would not be at risk because they would inherit his Y chromosome by definition, that is what makes them sons rather than daughters, but his daughters would all inherit the affected X chromosome because it's the only one he has. So by passing that on and making them daughters rather than sons, we know he will definitely cause them to be carriers. But for most conditions that follow this inheritance pattern, they wouldn't actually be affected themselves. It would only be a risk to the next generation. And an example of a condition that follows this inheritance is something like Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy, which can be associated with cardiomyopathy. Okay, and then moving on to X-linked dominant inheritance. So this is relatively rare, but this is basically a situation where a disease is caused by a change in a gene on the X chromosome, but it does affect women as well. So even if a woman has one normal copy and one abnormal copy, she still develops disease. The general pattern is similar in that we often see males who are badly affected, 
but women are affected as well in this case. So usually what we see is men are more severely affected and women are more mildly affected. Again, there's no male to male transmission because men pass on their Y chromosome, so they cannot pass on an X linked condition to their sons. And the risks for an affected female are 50% risk of passing on the disease causing allele and therefore having an affected child with the caveat that a son is likely to be more severely affected than a daughter, but they would probably both be affected. And for an affected male, his sons are not as at risk because again, he cannot pass on his X chromosome to a son, but all of his daughters would be affected with the condition because they would all affect the abnormal, inherit the abnormal X chromosome. And uh, Danon disease is a particular condition, which is an example of excellent dominant inheritance, which can be associated with heart disease. OK, so that's just a recap of the X-linked inheritance patterns. Again, the key is this lack of male to male transmission that can sometimes be a useful hint. All right, and briefly just to finish up mitochondrial inheritance. So again, now we're talking about this completely separate mitochondrial genome, which is totally separate from the chromosomes in the nucleus. The important thing about this is we inherit it from our mothers. So when the sperm and egg cell meet, they each have their own mitochondria. But after fertilization, the mitochondria from the sperm are destroyed and we're left with only the mitochondria from the egg cell. So they're all derived from the mother's cell. Um, this is hopefully a way of just really imprinting that on your mind. Um, it's important to know it can be passed on to all children regardless of their gender. So it's the gender of the parent that matters. It is the mother as opposed to the father who passes it on, but it doesn't matter whether she has a son or a daughter, they're equally likely to inherit it. It's not passed on by males and there's a phenomenon called heteroplasmy, um, which can determine how severe the disease is. And what that means basically is for some of these conditions, you can have a genetic change that's present in all of your mitochondria and that causes severe disease or a smaller number of mitochondria with some normal ones mixed in and that can have a protective effect. And this applies to mitochondrial disorders which can cause cardiac disease although they're usually a bit more complex. And this is sort of how it would look in a pedigree. So a female will pass it on to all of her children but males will not pass it on. So just to recap we've covered autosomal linked and mitochondrial inheritance. Um, I hope I haven't confused you too much um, and if you have any questions I'd be happy to take them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much Phil and um, I did appreciate that you were still feeling pretty rough with Covid so thank you so much one for stepping in and also um, for, for valiantly pushing through with Covid so thank you um, really enjoyed that talk and I to be honest I can't believe how much you covered mm. within such a short space of time you did it brilliantly so thank you so much um, not many questions yet everyone's a little bit quiet this afternoon but um, I do have one for you if that's okay um, could you um, elaborate a little bit more, explain the importance of having um, a, a really good family tree um, to accompany um, a diagnostic genetic test request? I think that's that, that's a really, really good question. So um, it, it, it is incredibly useful. So, um, you know, quite often when we are talking to people about genetics, the, the main question isn't so much the diagnosis in the patient who's unwell, it's about the risks to other relatives, you know, future children, that sort of thing. And having that information can be really, really helpful. Um, I think particularly for cardiac conditions where, you know, for things like, you know, dilated cardiomyopathy, for example, the diagnostic hit rate of genetic testing is still relatively low. So a large proportion of cases remain unexplained. We're often not able to offer specific genetic testing to see who's at risk and therefore having a clear pedigree that gives us an idea of what the inheritance pattern is at least gives us something to tell the family and you know, we always have to be careful to say you know none of this is definite unless we have a genetic diagnosis mm -hmm. but if we know what the inheritance pattern is likely to be then we can at least give them some idea how likely it is to have affected children for example. That's great. Thank you very much, Phil. That was an excellent talk and it leads on very nicely to our next speaker.